we are being bombarded. I set out to answer the question, can you influence your testosterone levels by eliminating artificial estrogens from your daily life? So I took some blood tests before and after a 12 week elimination experiment, and here are the results. So here's what I'm gonna cover. The background of what estrogen is and why it's become a problem in recent years, some of the health impacts that it's had on us, and then the experiment that I did, my baseline numbers, and what I did to eliminate those estrogens from my life, and some practical application of what you can do yourself. So if you don't know me, my name's Yusuf, I'm a doctor, coach, and lifter, and that's why this is a topic that concerns me on multiple levels. We are being drugged without our consent. So to give you some context on this, I went down the rabbit hole of estrogen recently after doing a podcast with Anthony Jay, who has a PhD in estrogen as the author of Estrogeneration, and I started to see the total health and environmental impact that artificial estrogens are having on us, particularly on the rates of cancer, obesity, infertility, metabolic syndrome, and even allergies. The problem with estrogen is that it's subtle. There's a time lag, it causes epigenetic modifications, it crosses the womb, it functionally alters your DNA. But it's not like being spiked with caffeine where suddenly you feel something and you have an instant urge to crack out the Ben and Jerry's and watch Sex in the City. Just a quick note to preempt any of the comments that might come in about this. I'm not talking about normal estrogen, which is essential for many biological functions in men and women, and we don't want it to be zero either. But what I'm talking about here is the excess, it's the accumulation from artificial estrogens, which is causing the medical complications that we're speaking about. What's worse is that over the long term, it also hampers your ability to gain muscle and lose fat. So it's stealing your gains. Now, as drug-free lifters, particularly if you've been training for some time, you need all the help you can get. You need to work for every scrap of testosterone that's available. Your hormones are precarious at the best of times. You've got to make sure that your diet, your training, your sleep, your recovery are all optimized. Otherwise, your testosterone will suffer. So before we go on, what is estrogen? This is the molecule. And you can notice the benzene ring on the bottom left. This is what interacts with the estrogen receptor in our bodies to cause the downstream effects that we're talking about. Now, this is the BPA molecule. It's got two of the little bastard benzene rings. It's like the T2000 version of estrogen. It's harder to destroy and it's much more powerful. Now BPA is one of the main compounds that we're exposed to, mostly in plastics, and it's in pretty much everything that we consume. There are some well-documented biological trends that point towards this effect of estrogen. So rates of erectile dysfunction have gone up, rates of metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, mitochondrial dysfunction, and reduced sperm count and morphology. This is not a tinfoil hat thing. You can ask any fertility doctor that over the last 30 years, we've had to keep moving the goalposts of what is the normal sperm count range because nobody nowadays has a normal sperm count by 1980s standards. The evidence for this stuff is starting to grow to the point where it is indisputable. These effects are happening at a cellular level and we're seeing it more pronounced in prepubescent and adolescent boys because their hormonal axis is still developing. Even plant estrogens, such as lavender oil, have been shown to cause gynecomastia, man boobs, or delayed puberty in children. There are alternative hypotheses that as we've gone through the industrial revolution, the number of female-headed households and female-dominated environments has increased in schools and at home, but this doesn't really explain the, the biochemical effects that we're seeing here. I'm fully aware at this point I probably look like this. And I don't want this estrogen stuff to be true, not least because I'm busy, man. Like, I've already got enough plates to juggle. I want my life to be simple. I want to be able to eat, train, recover, work, and not be driving with the handbrake on. As you know, for a long time, our motto at Propane Fitness was simple rules, dramatic results. And until recently, I always believed that trying to optimize your hormones was getting caught in the weeds of the minutia. I thought that if this is real, it's probably only negligible anyway, so it isn't something worth worrying about. I was wrong on this, as you're about to find out. The problem here is that the sheer doses that we're exposed to are no joke. It's pretty difficult to avoid as well. You might be thinking, okay, but like, I'm also busy. I've got other things to do as well. I feel fine. And what's the problem? Well, maybe but you can ask yourself, would you take the oral contraceptive pill for a laugh? Probably not. You'd certainly prefer that your estrogen levels were in the normal range of what a human is supposed to have, male or female. 
The problem is that the artificial estrogens that we're exposed to, they don't get metabolized like organic estrogen. They build up in the body and they're very difficult to excrete. On the other hand, this news might annoy you because the supplement industry is full of men trying to optimize their testosterone and got test boosters and anabolic steroids and pro-hormones and SARMs and SERMs and, and all the while we're getting systematically estrogenized. It's a bit of a hole in the bucket. So if you look at this diagram, you can see that different levels of BPA exposure are starting to have pretty frightening effects on the human body. Next, there's the losing your mojo aspect of it. Most men approaching 30 have a secret suspicion that they might be losing their mojo. They've not got quite as much lead in their pencil. They're not as uh, much of a, a young buck spring chicken anymore. Not as much fire in your belly and spring in your step. I've already noticed a palpable difference in my energy levels, sex drive, and capacity to gain muscle over the last few years. And most men my age experience something similar. But I'm not quick to pin this down to estrogen. There's many factors. So I'm older, I'm juggling more plates than I was when I was 20, I'm more stressed, I'm pretty slammed working as a junior doctor, and I'm closer to my genetic potential of muscle mass. So there's any number of reasons why I might feel this way. But after speaking to Dr. J, it makes you think, wouldn't you at least like to rule out the fact that we're just poisoning ourselves? So I thought for the sake of a few mildly inconvenient substitutions, it's worth me finding out. In worst case scenario, it makes for an interesting video. So I ran this little experiment and I want to try and save you the time and give you some data to work towards. And I would encourage you to try this yourself and see what happens. So here's what I did. I took two blood tests, which is a male hormone panel, 12 weeks apart, um, eliminating as many sources of environmental estrogen as I could in between that time. The blood test was the Male Hormone Plus by Medichex. They're a great company. You just send a capillary blood sample in the post and they give you the results within a few days on a nice dashboard. And you can use the code PROPANE10 for 10% off. The blood tests were taken at the same time of day, similar circumstances in terms of fed state, training state, sleep quality. And during those 12 weeks, I didn't significantly alter anything else in my life as much as I could. So I didn't change my sleep, training or supplementation routine. I didn't start drinking or smoking. I didn't alter my egg intake, my sexual frequency, my meditation practice, any of that stuff. Tried to hold things constant. The next step was eliminating my daily exposure to estrogens. You'd think it's simple enough to find and eliminate all the possible sources of estrogen that you're consuming. No, these come in the form of plastics, food additives, fragrances, plant foods, receipts, polyester clothing, canned foods, carpeted floors, vinyl floors, chewing gum, essential oils, animal f feed additives, corn-fed beef, sunscreens, pollutants, pesticides, laundry powders, tap water, and cosmetics. Ah, no problem. I'll just go live in a cave and forage for wild mountain stream fish. Ah, of course, even Swiss mountain stream fish are starting to become intersex with genital morphological differences and elevated levels of BPA in their blood. So some plant estrogens to look out for particularly are flax, soy, lavender, and tea tree. And then in terms of artificial estrogens, you want to look out for BPA, full fat dairy, phthalates, parabens, pesticides, insecticides, atrazine, benzophenones, and any plastics with the recycling codes 1, 3, 6, and 7. <laughs> in the US, atrazine is the big one. It's actually a pesticide that's banned in the EU. In the UK, plastics and phthalates are the highest yield things to eliminate. In particular, heating food in plastic is the big one to avoid. Estrogen and its analogues are lipophilic and they dissolve particularly well into fatty or acidic foods. When that's heated, that goes up by a hundredfold as you can see from this diagram. That's why even things like getting into a hot car on a sunny day can increase your exposure. Now. As an aside, I'm aware of how neurotic this sounds, and so the key for me is finding out what are the minimum effective dose of the things that I can do without it being a big impingement on my life. So here are the product substitutions that I made. Lavender bed spray and oil burner, I switched it for different essential oils. I used a lush Happy Hippie shower gel, which has parabens in, I switched it for e-cover washing up liquid. Um, Herbal Essences shampoo, it's full of the stuff. Switched it for no poo, which I'll talk about in a second. Instant coffee, stopped that, switched to green tea. Colognes, I just sprayed it directly onto my clothes or didn't use any fragrances as much as possible. Semi-skimmed milk, switched it for skimmed or red top milk. 
toothpaste, switch to euthymol. Wax candles, switch to beeswax candles. Carpets and vinyl floor, just try to wear socks in the house as much as possible. Um, rubbing receipts all over my face, I um, just stopped doing that. If anyone asked me for a receipt, I was like, no. Um, washing up liquid, switching fragrance washing up liquid for e-cover washing up liquid was also my, my shower gel. I switched my plastic protein shaker for a steel one. Now I avoided using skin creams and chewing gum during that time. I switched plastic Tupperware to Ikea glass Pyrex Tupperware, switched my washing powder to an e-cover detergent, and I got rid of my Teflon rice cooker and got a steel instant pot instead. I also switched from a plastic to a glass kettle. Even in trying to find these sources, I gained a bitter sense of cynicism trying to find the alternatives. Finding products that don't just substitute one form of estrogen with another is close to impossible. Even the ostensibly paraben-free, phthalate-free products employ sneaky tactics to basically insist on putting some form of estrogen in your cosmetics. It's ridiculous. Some of these sneaky tactics are if they advertise as paraben-free, they're laden with phthalates. If they advertise as phthalate-free, they're laden with parabens. It's the old trick of, oh, this, this butter is sugar-free and these marshmallows are fat-free. Like, yeah, obviously. Phthalate-free and paraben-free products usually hide more powerful estrogen analogues under the bracket of parfum or fragrance, which you probably will have seen if you're weird like me and like to read the back of the shampoo packet. The Trade Labeling Act allows you to hide proprietary blends under the term fragrance or parfum, and most companies use this as a legal loophole to sneak in the nastier compounds, particularly BHT, oxybenzone, phthalates, and octinazate. Like, then, what do you do when you finally find a product that's free from parfums, phthalates, parabens, you find something that's plant-based, and it's made entirely from flax? And there's two flavour choices, lavender or grapefruit. Like, is this some kind of joke? I was previously using a lush shower gel, Happy Hippie, because that's a company that markets themselves as being plant-based and additive-free. Unfortunately, it turns out they're just as bad, if not worse, than most other shower gels, um, based on this report, usually because they're water-based and so they have to use a lot more synthetic preservatives, which, estrogenic, right? So it gets worse. Wearing clothes washed with regular detergents has enough estrogen to impact our blood concentrations. Many cosmetics also contain propylene glycol, which is an additive to improve the absorption into the skin. And remember, hormonal agents can be absorbed transdermally. Estrogen and testosterone creams are often prescribed in that kind of form. Propylene glycol further enhances the ability of the estrogenic compounds to get into your bloodstream. Shower gels, skin moisturizers, even lube. Like, nothing is sacred. So think carefully next time you think to rub a synthetic estrogen cocktail directly into your gonads. But of course, that there are paraben-free alternatives that use benzophenones instead. Or there's natural alternatives that are entirely flax-based and five times the price, so you can pick your poison. That wasn't a fart, by the way. That was my foot on the chair. We've got to accept that manufacturers don't care. It's not about a great conspiracy. It's simply the cost-benefit for the manufacturer that, for example, for them, to make a cheap washing-up liquid that smells nice and cleans the dishes is all that they care about. It's not their problem if you develop man boobs. And as Dr. J says, who needs scented dishes? It's gratuitous. This was quite difficult for me to figure out because I'm just a doctor, I'm not a chemist. So trying to attempt to make these substitutions, I couldn't be 100% sure that everything I was using was squeaky clean. I used the e-cover washing up liquid as the closest estrogen free alternative that I could find. But while it has fewer additives, it still contains the mysterious parfum, which is a red flag and also sodium laureth sulfate under the term anionic surfactants. It is truly ridiculous how much digging you have to do to eliminate this stuff. And this is for someone who is scientifically literate and obsessional enough to follow this through. I did ask the company, but I didn't get a complete answer. Oh, but at this point it's fine, because maybe I can just use all the BPA-free plastics. Oh no, wait, BPAF, BPB, BPC, they all have just as much, or if not more, anti-androgenic activity. This is ridiculous. Okay, so what about the things that we eat or drink? Well, our water sanitation system is great for eliminating bacteria, 
but it's not so good for breaking down estrogen, which, surprisingly enough, is a very robust molecule. And because of animal estrogen treatment and the oral contraceptive pill and plastics and everything leaching into the water supply, over time, these concentrations build up and up and there's no way for them to get cleared out. So what's the solution? Well, you could get a water filter, but oh, uh, it's made of plastic as well, okay. They filter out about half of the estrogen in general. Oh, okay, well, I'll just stick with bottled water. Oh, no. Okay, well, I'll just drink milk all the time. Oh, no, can't do that either. So we're stuck. Anthony recommended this to me, which gets rid of 99.9% .9 of estrogens, but it's available only in the US. And I couldn't find an alternative one in the UK, so I didn't change anything about my tap water consumption. Luckily, the burden of tap water estrogen in the UK is much lower than that of the USA. And because it's chlorinated, that helps to eliminate some of the birth control estrogens too. Unfortunately, that's only a small percentage of the total load of estrogen, and most of it comes from plastics. If I was to do this again and I had access to one, I'd probably get a Barclay water filter. But what about the planet? Don't get me started on this. Manufacturing waste and recycling is a regulatory problem. I don't think they should be palming this off onto the consumers. When you're incentivizing manufacturers to clean up oil spills with baby seals, you can't expect the individual consumer to go out of their way to clean out their little Marmite jar. It's just the limpest attempt at trying to save the world. As Sean Locke says, it's like turning up to a earthquake with a dustpan and brush. It skirts around the real culprits. Policymakers need to align the incentives of the producer and the consumer, and that can only be done when biohazards become completely indisputable and policy is forced to change. I hate this. Like, why couldn't industrial waste and plastics produce some kind of fun hormone instead, like testosterone or endorphin? I'd even settle for thyroxine. At least then we'd all be, like, quite nervous but really shredded. The difficulty here is that oil fractions and plastic derivatives are so widely used in packaging, food production, cosmetics, construction, and these hydrocarbons all share the similar chemical property, which is that benzene ring. And that's what causes them to interact with the estrogen receptor. Okay, so a side note on shampoo. I don't have a whole lot of hair, so I struggled to find an appropriate substitution online, and I thought rather than run the risk of messing up the experiment by accidentally finding something that has a hidden ingredient in for my entire two grams of hair, I thought instead I'll just go no shampoo. There's actually a movement of people online that claim that not using shampoo is better and you end up with softer hair. So I thought, okay, double experiment, may as well give it a go. After six weeks of trying this, I didn't notice much difference, bit of an anticlimax. Um, my hair maybe was a bit drier, but that was it. Then I started using the e-cover washing up liquid. <laughs> so here are the results of my experiment. This is a photo before and after of my physique. Not much difference. There's a 200 gram difference in body weight, which I think is insignificant. In terms of measurements, also nothing to write home about. But here's where it gets interesting. This is my blood test before and after. In the before section, my testosterone was below normal. Remember, this reference range is for anyone between 18 and 70. So my testosterone was lower than expected for like a 70 year old man. At the end of the experiment, my testosterone went up slightly, but it went from subnormal into the normal range, which is pretty cool. So here are the changes in both free testosterone and total testosterone, both of which are pretty encouraging. If you're interested in a more in-depth interpretation of the hormone results, have a look at Dr. J's write-up in the link in the description below. For the conclusion, subjectively speaking, I didn't feel that much different before and after, but there's a few reasons for that. So I was ostensibly healthy to begin with. I've never been a particularly heavy user of cosmetics or tinned food or plastics. And I'm fortunate enough to live in the UK where a lot of the more potent estrogenic additives are banned. As with many of these kind of optimization additives, a lot of the benefits that you see can come from taking someone out of a dysfunctional pathological state into a normal one. So a few examples of that could be noob gains when someone begins a weightlifting program that they've never trained before, they go from extreme inactivity to frequent heavy targeted activity and they get massive muscle gains. The same with the evangelical nofap community. A lot of them claim that they're getting huge changes in their productivity and muscle and confidence and women approaching them out of nowhere and all this stuff. And of course, if you spend 
four hours a day masturbating, and then you go from that to not at all, then of course you're going to see improvements in your life. You're more confident because you can now look people in the eye without the shame of masturbating four hours a day. Sobriety, another one. So a lot of the benefits are proportional to how much of a heavy drinker you were in the first place. And the same with weight loss. If you weigh 200 kilos, then you can lose a phenomenal amount of weight just by eating 3,000 calories a day. This is the concept of increasing marginal returns. So this wasn't a particularly rigorous study, but that's kind of the point. The question I wanted to answer was, does reducing estrogens in the real world have an effect on the body? And can it be heard above all the noise? In hindsight, maybe I should have been more rigorous. You know, you don't eat your target level of protein because you can feel it working. You know that the body of evidence supports something, and so you do it, trusting the science. So if you want to reproduce this experiment, please do and let me know the results in the comments below. It's difficult to control for all the variables. Stress levels ebb and flow, training progress is non-linear, and tracking something like morning wood may or may not be actually meaningful. So if you want to replicate this experiment, I would recommend that you track as many things as you can, you take multiple blood tests and draw out a trend line and an effect size, and follow my recommendations that I'm gonna cover in a second for what products that you can substitute with, because some of them, you can't be sure that they are actually an improvement. At the end of the day though, the answer to the question of can you influence your blood hormones by eliminating estrogens in your life, the answer appears to be yes. So there's a link in the description below with all the products that I would recommend if you're going to do an experiment like this yourself, but even if you're not, some of the highest yield ones would be the things that you put on and in your body. So the biggest one, and the one that should be at the top of your list, is Pyrex Tupperware. Stop microwaving food in plastic because that is just hundreds of times more potent than anything else. Some studies claim up to 400 times. Get yourself a steel protein shaker rather than a plastic one, and have a look at some of the cosmetic substitutions that I recommend as well. Finally, what else can you do? Well, there's a few ways that you can eliminate estrogen. So the liver is not equipped to fully metabolize some of the artificial sources, but you can clear it through sweating, which is interesting. So have a look at my video on the infrared sauna. If you're interested, it should be up there somewhere. Next, avoid cannabis and avoid alcohol. These are two big testosterone killers. And if you're really serious about gaining muscle and losing fat, these don't have a place in your life. And the third one is building muscle. This is a good way to inoculate yourself against multiple other problems, including all cause mortality, according to some studies. But this also helps you to mitigate some of the estrogen burden that you're exposed to. Muscle actually helps you to sweep up some of the stray estrogen. Plus, fat cells are hormonally active. They produce estrogen in themselves. So if you can stay lean, that's another bonus. If you're interested in more on how you can optimize your testosterone, have a look on our channel, have a look on our website. We've got loads of stuff on this. There's a few supplements that might be helpful, but really these are the tip of the iceberg. ZMA is the big one, but there's also ashwagandha and boron if you want to be a bit more experimental. There are also environmental estrogens that are just beyond our control, like air fresheners at work and shops, and some plastic and food is unavoidable. But the best we can hope for, rather than trying to become Ben Greenfield and living in a wood hut off-grid, is, is to reduce your total estrogen burden. So all of these recommendations will at least help you to hedge your bets, and I would recommend doing some blood tests so that you can prove to yourself that this is worth your effort. So there is the result of my estrogen experiment. Well done for making it this far. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, there's a full write-up of the entire thing in the description below, along with all of the product recommendations too. Okay, I would recommend having a look at this video next, and I will speak to you soon.